Good morning, church. It's good to be together as we celebrate the promises of God. If you're with us virtually, we are grateful you are in our midst as well. Uh, If you're here virtually, I want to remind you that it's uh, the Lord's table today, so go ahead and get your elements at home ready for us. Our call to worship comes from the psalmist. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Sisters and brothers, let us worship our God. as we pray the prayer of confession found in our bulletins. O oh God, who by your spirit can rekindle the... everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sin is forgiven.
seated. It is good to be together. Happy New Year. And as we begin this new year, we want to make sure that we celebrate your presence with us. There is a connection card attached to your bulletin. Please be sure to fill that out. On the back is an opportunity for prayer concerns and praises. If you check confidential, only our pastoral team will see um, your request. Otherwise, our elders, deacons, and prayer ministers will pray over those in the coming hours. If you're watching online, we're glad that you're here as well. And you can participate in the connection card as well. You just hit the connection card button above the live feed. Also want to remind those who are, who are at home that we will be celebrating communion later. So be sure to get your elements ready. Um, great things happening in the life of our congregation. Today we are beginning a read through the New Testament in 30 days. You'll see in your bulletin a bookmark that you can use to, um, to check off those the, the readings as you go through. Also, we really encourage you to use the Bible app. There is a QR code on the back of the bulletin where you can um, download the, the U version and actually be in the First Presbyterian Norfolk room um, where we can communicate with each other and encourage one another. So we really encourage you to do that. I'm going to call on Amy Rutledge, who's on our women's um, Re retreat team to come forward to share with you a little bit about the retreat coming up the end of February. Hi. So next month we will have our women's retreat. It'll be in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. So right on the beach. Um, if you're looking for a getaway, it'll be February 23rd through the 25th. And we have a great speaker coming. Her name is Elise. She is a teacher, but she has a powerful message. I haven't met her personally yet, but I've talked to her virtually, and I already love her. I want to be her best friend already. Um, but it's a powerful weekend. If you ever just need to get away, it'll nourish your soul. It's good fellowship. Walking on the beach is fulfilling in itself. So I know life has big demands, and we often can't get away, but we often have to prioritize ourselves getting away for this weekend, you come back being a better mom, a better wife, a better grandma. So please think about signing up. If you sign up by January 31st, you're entered for a drawing. Also, if you're waiting to sign up, looking for roommates, you can still sign up. Let us know that you're thinking about rooming with somebody and we can just work that in. So don't wait till the last minute and I hope to see you all there. Great, thanks Amy. Now, if you would please stand and greet one another. It's good to be together. Star Wars costume that she wore every day of the week 
It didn't matter what day of the week it was. It didn't matter what month it was. She dressed up as Princess Leia. And all she wanted for Christmas was a Millennium Falcon Lego set that had 1,300 pieces. And Santa Claus brought it to her. And fortunately for um, the Johnston family, Arlie's dad is an engineer. And he spent an entire week putting that thing together. Have you ever put together a big Lego set? And it takes so many takes so much time, and when you get to those really big sets, they have little bags that say, now next you do this, and next you do that. It was very complicated, and an art major, I, I had no part of that. It was just an engineer's work. And so Ian and Arlie spent all week putting it together, and then Sunday came around, and the football game was on, and Ian brought his friends over with their boys, and you're not gonna believe what happened. After they spent the whole week, the boys went upstairs, and the next thing you knew, Arlie was screaming, and the Millennium Falcon was in 1,300 pieces. And that Millennium Falcon never got put back together, and still to this day, Arlie's 17, so it's 12 years later, we talk about it all the time. It upsets Ian, it upsets me, it upsets Arlie, and the Millennium Falcon is in 1,300 pieces in, in a box because we could never figure out how to get it together when they weren't in those bags. So it was so sad. So it makes me think about what Jim is going to preach on today. And he's going to preach on something in the New Testament when Jim is, um, when Jesus is teaching um, to um, the disciples and to all the people. And he is talking about building. And he is talking about building something on um uh, Strong ground and talking about building something on um, not strong ground. Have you ever been to the beach and built a sandcastle? How many of you, uh, Parker, would you want to live in a sandcastle during a hurricane? Um, well, we'd like fall apart unless it would have like a force field or something. Yeah, it would be terrible. It's a terrible choice. So if a hurricane came, would you rather live on the sand in a sandcastle or would you rather live in, on, on a house that was built at the top of the hill on a rock? I think I would choose, you know, just like this show called You vs. Wild, it's like we're disguised versus wild, like lions and stuff. You have two choices, Parker. And, and so I would... <laughs> You're supposed, to, you're supposed to pick the, the, the rock, right? And so then we're supposed to talk, Parker, about the fact that um, Jesus used that story to teach all the people, the old people, the young people, the disciples, about how to live their life and how you're supposed to live your life on solid ground and how you can do that in Jesus, right? So ways that we can live our life on solid ground is by going to church and by reading and by singing and praying and doing all those things that make us stronger in Jesus. Would you like to say something? Um, one time. <laughs> Would you like to say it now or later? I got it. Oh. Lego set. You did get a Lego set. Cool. Yes, excellent. Yes. Um, um, I took it apart but um, to make other cool things, but the dad put it together without the numbers on the bags. Are you trying to say that your dad is smarter than my husband? Oh, okay. Well, I think he might be. I don't know. He's pretty smart. All right. So, um, listen. So we, we are supposed to think about ways that we can build our life on solid ground. And so we want to do that by reading the Bible and going to church and singing and praying and being together, right? So that when life has storms coming, like going to new schools and being in a new classroom or moving to a new town and making new friends and living in a new place, you have Jesus to fall back on, right? So I'm going to close this in prayer, and we're going, to go up to, we're going to go up to Children's Church and learn about building our life on a solid ground. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord, and thank you for the privilege that we have to be here. Um, and thank you for the privilege that you have sent your son Jesus to teach us these stories, Lord. And we pray that today we will learn just a little bit more about you and your son, Lord, so that we can continue to grow a strong foundation so that when storms come... Um, we know how to stay strong through you. In your heavenly name, amen. amen. All right, let's go. Come on.
Okay, get your Bibles, and we're going to be in the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Matthew today, and uh, we'll be at towards the end of the chapter. And if you're using a pew Bible, you will find it on page 972 in the paging of our Bibles. <clears throat> okay, Matthew chapter 7 beginning with verse 24. And I want you to use a Bible because I want to do something with it with you today. So um, Matthew chapter 7, I'm going to pick up at verse 24. Now these are the words of Jesus. Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So let's just pause right there. Uh, Context is critical for this. So Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. So what are these words? So if you take your Bible and you flip back to chapter 5, just a page, you'll see that at the beginning of chapter 5, it says this. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Jesus begins to teach. And you'll see that in chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, it is only the words of Jesus. It's a sermon. And we often call it the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has separated his disciples in a sense they've separated themselves from the crowd they've gone up higher and jesus begins to teach them but the crowd is still gathered around and so when jesus go back to chapter 7 verse 24 when jesus says therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man these words of mine are the words in chapter 5 6 and 7. it's not like everything jesus said it's just early in jesus's ministry he starts with this Sermon on the Mount. Now, so what is that, right? So we can preach on this text about rock and stone and all of that, but we need to know what the words of Jesus are. We need to understand what the Sermon on the Mount is. When you go back and look at the Sermon on the Mount, you'll realize that the Sermon on the Mount is a... It is Jesus talking to his disciples about what it is to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. It's... It's about how they are to live and what they are to do in this world. It's not a preparation for heaven. It's not a preparation for something else. It's but just who they are supposed to be and the values, the things that they are to claim in this life. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, if you stick back to Matthew chapter 5, you'll see something very interesting. So this is all part of, this is one of our eight chapters today for our read through the Bible and uh, through the New Testament in 30 days, and I hope you'll do it. You'll see that in chapter 5, six times Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. So let me give you an example. If you go to verse 21 in chapter 5, this is what you hear. This is the first time Jesus says it. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, which is a curse, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Let's look at another one. Let's go to, there's six of them. Let's just go to verse 33. Jesus says, Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Don't break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, don't swear an oath at all, either by heaven, or by, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is a footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is a city. Let's look at another. Um, let's go down to the last one. Verse 43 in chapter 5. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that they may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes a son. So what you'll see here is this really odd thing that Jesus is doing. It's early in his ministry. And he's saying to them, 
you have heard, meaning you've read this in the Bible, or the teachers of the Bible have told you this, but I say something else, or I interpret it in a different way. And so very clearly we see that Jesus is saying to those disciples, he's claiming this authority, the authority of God. He's claiming to be the son of God by simply saying, you've seen, you've heard this, you've heard the teachers of the law, you've read this in the Bible, but I'm saying to you, and we're going to come back to this because it's critical to our text. But that lets us know, again, when in chapter 7, go back to verse 24, then we're going to get into it. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, we know what those words are. He's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it didn't fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. That's the word of the Lord. So I read a book recently by John Eldridge called Resilient. Um, Eldridge... Um, I wrote a book some years ago called Wild at Heart that had a big impact on the Christian, kind of Christian men's movement. Um, this one is really talking about life after COVID and sort of the challenges that are before us and how hard life can be. But he tells an opening story that I don't think I'll ever forget. He says that camels have an Achilles heel. So a camel can go, it's estimated, up to a month without water. They can walk through the desert, go thousands of miles with very little food, if any. They keep the same pace. They work, they walk at the same rhythm. They're, they're amazing in that. And that's why they are so highly preferred over all other animals, especially for those who would be in the deserts or in the, in the, in the deserted lands where there's little water, where there's little food. They're incredible. But the Achilles heel of a camel is that though it keeps the same pace, though it walks in the same way, though it carries the same weight, sooner or later, the camel will just reach a point where it kneels down and dies. No warning, no explanation, just kneels down and dies. Horses are different. They get tired and you know they're tired. You realize what they need, what they're Camels just quit and die. And this is what Eldridge says. Human souls hide an Achilles heel too. We have an astonishing capacity to rally in the face of calamity and duress. We rally and rally, and then one day we discover there's nothing left. Our soul simply says, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. As we collapse into discouragement, despair, or just blankness of soul. You don't want to push your soul to that point. And Jesus recognizes this. He recognizes this, this overwhelming piece of life. He sees it, he uses different imagery, but he sees it amongst his people collectively and individually. Jesus is a Jew. Five to six hundred years from being proud to have a kingdom. Jews who have been for generation and generation, for centuries and centuries, oppressed and controlled by others. Whether it be the Babylonians or the Persians or in Jesus' life, the Romans, they're held under control by someone else. They've been oppressed so long that they've lost what it was that this king that they so loved, David, thought and believed. This David, this king who wrote most of the Psalms, we're told, who had this deeply intimate personal relationship with his God. This beautiful relational peace has been cast aside for a camel theology. 
And at the time of Jesus, all that was really left for the Jews was simply to believe that they existed as an ethnic identity. We may not be able to control our land. We may not be able to control our government. We may have no power over anything, but at least we are who we are. I think it's one of the reasons why they hated the Samaritans so much, because they had intermarried, they had been Jews, and now they weren't, or they were contaminated in some sense, they believed. They live in this camel theology that all they've got is just this sense of we're going to just keep going and going and going as long as we can go. And individually, it's the same. <clears throat> You'll read in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, don't carry someone's stuff for a mile, carry it for two miles. You remember that, right? Don't just carry it for a mile, carry it for two miles. Here's the context for that. The context in that is, in the time of Jesus, a Jewish man, if a Roman soldier approached him, was required to carry that soldier's armor for a mile. It's a law. The armor weighed between 80 and 150 pounds, it's estimated. So the Roman soldier didn't want to carry it. He'd go find a Jewish man. Easy to do. They're in Judea. He would take him and say, here, you carry my stuff for a mile. Jesus said, don't carry it just for a mile. Carry it for two. We'll talk about that in another context, what that means. But here's what it is for them. Not just as a people, but individually. They're at the risk of dropping to their knees. And Jesus realized it's the same for us. So he gathers this crowd of camels. And he talks about a kingdom. A kingdom of heaven. An alternative to the world. A different way. He, and he asks throughout the Sermon on the Mount. In essence, he's asking, what is it to live in the kingdom of God? And it's intriguing the way he answers it. You've heard it said, but I say You've heard it said, don't commit murder. You've heard it said, don't divorce. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. You've heard it said, don't break an oath. You've heard it said, but I say to you, which is in your heart, what are you thinking about a person? What are you saying about them? That's accountable as murder. What is in your heart? What is in your heart? Every time Jesus speaks, he speaks of an intent. And what he does in this beautiful, masterful way is he separates law. You've heard it said. Don't do this. Do this. He separates that, the what, from the why. Here's why oaths are so dangerous. Here's why what's in our heart is so dangerous, whether we act on it and commit murder or not. And when he moves from the what to the why, this is the key for everything Jesus does. It's a key for his life. It's a key for what he teaches. It's a key for what he models. And Jesus would say to us that joy is found in the why. And so is resilience. So is this ability to be able to to see and to continue and to, and to find meaning in the midst of things, even when life is so overwhelmingly challenging. I read an article, um, I don't know how long ago, relatively recently, in a publication, and I can't find the article, but it's written by a woman who said that there are really three types of jobs. And the three types of jobs are based on when you take a shower. Okay. So here's the first. You get up in the morning, take a shower, you get dressed, and you go to work. You're going to put on a tie. You're going to wear a dress. You're going to, you're going to go to a, what we would back in the day call a white-collar job. Okay. You get up in the morning and you go to work, and you work in a factory or warehouse, or you work outside in construction or and you come home you take a shower after you've gone to work and then there's the third kind of work <clears throat> you knock on someone's door and a young woman comes to the door and you say I'm here to see your mom she's excited to see you 
Her mom doesn't get many visitors. She has dementia. And this young woman has dedicated all of her time, day after day after day, caring for her mom. She looks at you and she says, come on in, my mom will be excited to see you. She probably won't remember you, but she'd love to see you. And while you're here, would you mind if I sneak off and take a shower? It's what I call super mom, super mom power. So <clears throat> I don't think there's a, a mom around that believed before she had kids that she would do what she did after she had kids. You moms touch stuff. Liquid stuff, viscous stuff, kind of semi-solid stuff. Are we together? Did you ever imagine that you were going to do that? Did you ever imagine that you could do that? Why? The why is the answer. You do it because you know why. You understand why you're doing it. You understand the value. You see this in this child. You see you're called to something that is bigger than you. My favorite, one of my favorite novels, and I don't recommend it, it's dark, um, but it is still one of my favorite novels, is um, it's called The Road by Cormac McCarthy. Everything McCarthy wrote is dark. But it's a story of <clears throat> sort of a post-apocalyptic kind of world where something unexplained has happened and there are very few people left in the world and there's this man and a woman and their child who sense that they need to move from the north and get to the south to the coast that that's where somehow they just believe that that's where something is going to happen that's good for them the the mom dies relatively early it's dark in the story and so then it's left with this father and his son and as he moves, he encounters all of these different things. Twice, they're almost taken by cannibals. They, they find all of these threats, all these different kinds of things. And this father, overwhelmingly protecting and guarding his son as they keep moving down that road, down that road, moving to the south, moving to the coast. And towards the end of the novel, the son, having seen all the things that his dad had done along the road, looks at his dad and he says to him, what's the bravest thing you've ever done? And the father looks at him and he says, getting up this morning. Jesus says, you have a choice. You can, you can hear and do, or you can hear and not. Jesus says that believing is not the key. We can say we believe that he's the son of God. We can say that we believe that, that, that God is powerful. We can say that we believe these things. But that's not enough. It's not the point. It's those who hear and do. Jesus says that the key for us is waking up and getting out of bed. And knowing why. Being alive today. This is the call for us. This is the call for us, not simply just to put one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other, but understanding why we're doing it. Understanding this amazing value. I go back to the road with McCarthy and what he's done with this father is throughout you see that the father believes, he believes first off that God has for some reason given him this child to protect. And secondly, he believes that that if he, what he does and how he lives is a witness to this child. And so it is for us. This sense that it's not simply about just one foot, one foot, one foot, but it's understanding why. It's being able to believe and to trust in the promises of God, even when it's the worst that the world seems to bring to us. Even on those days when we would choose, if it were us, not to get up, but simply to kneel down and quit. And so what about you? What about us? You feel like a camel? Just one foot, one foot, 
one foot after the other, after the other, after the other. Well, sooner or later, you're going to kneel down. And here's the amazing beauty. You get to choose. You get to choose whether you quit and die, or you get to choose whether you live and worship. This is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the rock on which he calls us to build. This is our life. It has meaning even when we can't see it. It has power even when we don't recognize it. It has this amazing sense of not simply re resilience, but of joy, of joy, of joy, all along the road. Let us be those people. Let us not simply hear, but let us hear and do. Let us be those people. Amen. 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 A beautiful word for us today as we, as we contemplate how it is that we will respond. I encourage you to uh, remember your connection card that's attached to your bulletin. Be sure to place it in the offering plate as it comes by. Um, as the ushers pass that from one person to the next. So if you are watching online, you can participate in the offering as well. Uh, there's a button above the live feed that says give. Just click on that button. It will walk you through the giving process or anyone can use text to give. And that number is 757-530-5683. You type in the word give, the amount you'd like to give, send the text. As we, as we respond to God's word today, I encourage you to, to open your heart, to open your life, to think about when it is that, that you want to take a shower, um, how it is that you're going to live out this powerful word to us today.
gracious Heavenly Father, for all the gifts you pour down upon us, we thank you and praise you. And from your bounty, Lord, we give you these, our tithes, our additional offerings, our commitments, our prayers. Use them for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. As we turn to the Lord's table today, we bring to the table our prayers. And so this day we hold up prayers for peace in our world, particularly today in Ukraine, and Gaza, Israel, Palestine, Syria. We lift up those in our nation who are in public service, and today, particularly our first responders and our military and their families. We lift up within our city, the leadership of our city, those who are in need, um, who have been part of our winter sheltering, um, that, you would, uh, that God would provide uh, solutions for them in their need. And I want to invite you to consider joining us with Crisis Pregnancy Center and their baby bottle drive. You'll see baby bottles if you go this way um, to the glass tower doors. <clears throat> and you pick those up and fill them up with cash or checks and um, bring them back to the common. Uh, and uh, just an opportunity for us to be able to support the good work that they do. We hold up prayers for our church and encourage you to do the New Through 30, reading through, it's basically eight chapters a day, and I promise you it can be, it will be life-changing for you, reading through the New Testament. We hold up Chris McKinnon Hing and her husband Zach, as we do each week, and we also lift up parents, prayers for her parents, Pat and Colin McKinnon. We lift up Emily Christopher, our contemporary worship leader, who's beginning cancer treatment this month. We hold up Tom Celeste in his battle with cancer and for his wife, Faye Lane Hathaway. We hold up Nancy McGee in hospice care and Tom Jones in his continued recovery. We hold up Monica Baker upon the death of her grandmother. And we celebrate the gift of new life um, for uh, Jesse Saunders, who was born on January 3rd to Lisa and Jake. These prayers and so much more come to the table with us. So, we can say what this table is. It's debated and asked and all. Or we can seek to understand why. Why is it that Jesus calls us to come on a regular basis along the journey of the road? To come and to be filled again. This is one of those places where our lives are enriched and changed and strengthened. This is the place for us to find ourselves. It was the night in which he was betrayed. He took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to them, and he said, this is my body, it's given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after having supped, he took the cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for the forgiveness of sins, this do in remembrance. For as the Apostle Paul tells us, as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus drew under prayer that night. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the gift of this day. We thank you for the gift of your Son. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your life. We thank you for not simply what you've done, but why you've done it. So that our sins might be absorbed on the cross by the one sinless man. And we pray, Lord, that we would come and your spirit would come and rest upon us and remind us it doesn't matter what our denominational affiliation is, it doesn't matter what our standing in the community is, it doesn't matter even what we think about ourselves. All that we need as baptized believers is to come to this table and say, yes, Lord, fill me for the journey. Lord, we thank you and praise you. And we pray that these common and ordinary elements and these common and ordinary lives would be set aside for something holy and sacramental. And it is in your name that we pray, in your name that together we sing. <coughs>
usher, as our servers come forward, um, they will bring you a plate. And uh, we ask that you take of the bread and the cup, and then as you turn to your neighbor, hold it for them um, as they partake as well. For these are the gifts of God for the people.
pray that you would set your seal upon our hearts. Summon up what we should be as your people so that more we come to know you and love you. We thank you for hosting us at your table, for giving us a why, and help us each morning be awake and alive in you. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. with us for the first time we've got a little gift for you it's a book by rick warren called what on earth am i here for it's short it's about purpose and meaning in life um, it's great and you don't have to sign anything or shake a hand it's totally free if you go out this way back the sanctuary there in the narthex area you'll see a little table the books are there we'd love for you to come this way by the pulpit and have pastries and coffee and hang out with us there's a larger table where the books are there if you want to hold up anything in prayer, whatever it is, come on up. Our prayer team has been praying for us. They'll be on the other side of the communion table at the end of the service. Please consider, it's basically eight chapters a day, read it through the New Testament in 30 days. I promise you it can be a game changer uh, for you in your spiritual journey. So I am absolutely convinced that every single one of us in the journey of life has been entrusted with something special to be treasured. And how we carry it whether it feel a burden at times or whether we see the joy in it. How we carry it is a witness to this world. And so let us be these people that choose joy, that choose to know not just what we do, but why we do it, so that the good news of Christ might live in and through us on our journeys. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.